Hello, I'm Colin Nicholson with Witham Financial Services. I'm based in the Orlando, Florida office. And uh, today we're going to continue our discussion about the trend of managers, uh, investment managers, setting up operations or relocating entirely to lower tax uh, states and jurisdictions. Um, my guest today is Ron Geffner of the law firm Satis and Goldberg, one of the top 10 law firms in the hedge fund space globally. Ron's well known to a lot of you and, and an authority in the area of regulatory advisory to fund managers. And we're thrilled to have him here today to share his uh, thoughts and uh, expertise on the topic. And so, uh, so Ron, you have been actually uh, traveling down to uh, Miami and, and such and, and speaking to some managers who are in this boat and on trend. Um, what can you tell us, and, and really what can you tell a newer manager who may not be thinking along the lines yet of uh, should I do this or should I not? Um, we've covered the tax considerations and benefits with my colleague, Mike Oates, uh, on a previous video interview. Um, but what about the legal and operational considerations um, that a manager should be involving their attorney with in terms of uh, evaluating whether to do this or whether to uh, to not? First, thank you to Witham and all my friends there for having me appear today. And it's a great subject matter and it comes up with greater frequency, especially with the onset of COVID and people working remotely. So regardless of your situation as a manager, wherever you are today and whatever your situation today may not be your situation tomorrow or the day after. So for new managers and existing managers, it's often quite important to look at how you're structured. Structured from the management entity perspective, with regard to, is there one entity receiving all the fees and allocations? Should you consider having several entities? Should those entities be structured as limited liability companies and limited partnerships? Where are your staff located, whether they are partners to the management team, whether they are employees or consultants, will have a tax effect possibly on your business? And where are the assets coming from and what type of assets and how are your fund structures? So we've seen as our clients change portfolio construction as well, Colin, that at times managers need to get a thought and come back to their professionals. So a manager trading securities in South America might be better served to trade the entire portfolio out of the US rather than offshore jurisdictions. So all these things are really relevant as you change portfolio construction, domicile of the principals, domicile of employees, domicile of consultants, look first and foremost at the structure holistically. The second component is look to the nature of the contracts you've signed. If you change the structure, there's a profound effect it has in possibly the agreements you've executed, which party has executed them. And, and when we're going through this process, while we're talking about tax efficiency today, it also deals about mitigating liability and reducing or avoiding cross collateral risk, meaning liability that might be taken on as a whole if you have multiple classes or multiple fund products and securing the incentive and carry, especially for those managers running both open end and closed end funds as well. And then we look to the nature of the employment agreements as well. Whether you have any protective rights for the benefit of the firm with non-competes, non-solicits, and it may be state law that governs to some degree what is input in the contract. And then finally, we also look to the regulatory implication, depending on the size of the manager, because registration requirements, while they're often triggered by federal laws, Commodity Exchange Act and Investment Advisors Act, there are also state laws that might affect those smaller managers and how they're registered in the capacity in which I need to reconsider. Great, thanks, Ron. And a question um, you mentioned in terms of the uh, state laws, et cetera. And, um, uh, tell us if, if I'm a manager and I'm based in New York right now, uh, my agreements are under presumably under the uh, state of New York law. Um, if I pick up and move entirely to Florida, how does um, how does that affect whether New York law can still apply to my agreements? Is there any any requirement to have any kind of nexus to the state, or um, is that not a factor? Well, it it's a factor on multiple levels, and really needs to be assessed on an individual basis. With regard to most of our fund documentation, 
we almost always have Delaware law apply, regardless of where the manager is domiciled. And even with our clients who do not reside in the New York area, but who have this preference for working with Savis and Goldberg, we routinely will draft agreements whereby it's New York courts and jurisdiction so that Savis can oversee the, um, to the, in the event it were to go to court, the interaction between the application to the court justice system. Okay, great. And uh, tell us about maybe some um, other jurisdictions that you've become aware of that are that are drawing some interest as well, in addition to Florida. Sure. So two of the main jurisdictions seem to be uh, Florida or Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, um, we see more and more people, not, not, not boatloads, but we're seeing a greater frequency of people physically moving there. One that recently came up is U.S. Virgin Islands. Similar treatment to Puerto Rico, it's still part of the United States. And then there are other offshore jurisdictions that at times managers consider moving to. We've had those calls with people considering moving to Cayman, Bermuda, BVI, and renouncing their U.S. citizenship. Less and less with Cayman recently because we're higher costs in maintaining offices in Cayman. Um, but those are the main ones. Okay. And is this a trend? Uh, it's been around for a while. Do you see this as continuing to kind of grow? We've seen a lot more headlines over the past, uh, say, 12 to 24 months um, with respect to Florida, where, where I am. So I see a lot of local headlines of uh, things happening in, in South Florida particularly. Do you see this as a, an ongoing trend beyond the pandemic, or is it something that is going to uh, run its course and then it'll die down eventually? So that's a, that's a million dollar question. What no one knows from people on the commercial real estate side to people working remotely, how much is this trend here to stay? And will it snap back where there's an expectation once coronavirus is under control, whenever that might be, with people coming back to their office? My, my sense is at the very least, it's going to persist for the next two to three years. This sense of, look, it worked during the pandemic, maybe not as well, but it still is functional. And there's an expectation of the workforce as to they want quality of life as well. So if that were the case, the, the trend of being able to work anywhere is going to continue. But what, whether it's going to sustain four, five, and six years from now, one doesn't know. I would think the reality is it's going to be a function of supply and demand. If we're dealing with a high employment rate and challenge to maintain and attract talent, it's going to be one more thing that employers provide in an effort to attract and maintain the talent. If, if it's a function of an unemployment skyrocketing, then I think the employer is going to have a greater choice. And then it's going to be up to that employer to decide what's best for their model. Um, some may actually be fine and prefer to have everyone remote. Um, others may just have a view that culturally they want to have uh, people with them in, in their in their office location. So, um, but it the technology depends in part on the type of work they're doing. So, if we talk mm -hmm. about regulated entities and the maintenance of confidential information, it's much harder to supervise that and other components that's required from a regulatory perspective. If you have 40 people at your firm and 38 of those people are working from home. What protocols do you have in place? So another offshoot to the question is, if you have people that were working originally in office that are now working remotely, we'd advise you to review your compl written compliance policies and procedures, your codes of ethics, and revisit those to see how it deals with people working remotely and to see whether it needs to be modernized. The other question will be for the technology enthusiasts or support, whether you need to modify or upgrade your technology from a regulatory and safety protocol standpoint. Yeah, those are great points. Well, thanks, Ron. Um, it's been very informative to have this discussion. And uh, do you have any last thoughts in terms of what what a prospective manager might want to think about in terms of uh, where they're going to domicile? Yeah, so I would say, look, it, we routinely receive phone calls from people where they're launching a product and the principals are not even located on the same coasts, same countries. So that's been a routine experience that you've probably had as well as I have. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just constantly being reinforced that it's, if it were feasible before, it's even more feasible now. 
But the advice would be that nothing's really ever static. Everything is dynamic. And when you look at your business model, you need to contemplate open architecture for that. And once you're set up, it doesn't mean that you're done and forever set. It requires an ongoing health check where you should probably have a routine call annually with your auditor and your law firm on the same call so that you can issue spot together. And I know people are very hesitant to do that because their feeling is ain't broke, don't fix it. But I would say it's like those insurance commercials that I try not to pay attention to with that ostrich and it puts its head <laughs> in the sand. That doesn't fly. Yeah, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, I think is the old is the old cliche. Added, yes. So yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to connect to your constituents. Thanks again, Ron. We'll look forward to speaking in the future. Sounds great.